Hello and welcome. My name is Kristen Talbot and I am the program coordinator for the MAVEN project. Thank you all for joining us today and to our friends at Cherokee Health for hosting today's session on common endocrine disorders with Dr. Pendergrass. Dr. Mary Pendergrass is a professor of medicine at the University of Arizona in Tucson, Arizona. She is currently clinical chief of the endocrinology division and director of endocrinology fellowship program. Dr. Pendergrass is a frequent lecturer for students, residents, fellows, and faculty at UA. She has lectured extensively both nationally and internationally. And prior to joining UA, she was on the faculty and established multi-professional diabetes programs at Harvard and Tulane Medical Schools. She's been principal investigator in several diabetes-related studies funded by the National Institute of Health, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and the Juvenile Diabetes Foundation. Dr. Pendergrass is the author and co-author of numerous book chapters, reviews in the scientific journal articles, primary related to diabetes and healthcare delivery. She currently serves on the advisory board of Nature Reviews Endocrinology, and we are very happy to have her as a MAVEN project volunteer. Dr. Pendergrass, when you are ready, please. Okay, well, I was checking my notes really quickly because um, according to my notes, I'm talking about treatment of hyperglycemia in type two diabetes, not common endocrine problems. You're correct, sorry about that. <laughs> All right, because I could switch if you wanted to, but um, this, is, this, is, uh, this is what we've got queued up. Let's talk about diabetes today. So um, I wanna start uh, with a case. So um, let's, here's a, a classic case, a 74 year old woman with type two diabetes, about 10 years. She's also got COPD and she is overwhelmed with social stressors. She can't pay for her medications. You know, she's having a hard time of it. She's currently maxed out on metformin. Her A1C is seven and a half and her EGFR is 70. And um, as y'all are thinking about what you would recommend we do for this patient, I'll tell you what I would do is I would just continue the same management. So I know that historically we focused on A1C control and you know people might look at this 7.5 and say, no, nah, it's not less than seven, she needs better control. Um, but I just you know, wanna remind us all that you know, the, the, it's, the, that guideline for seven, less than seven for most patients really refers to most patients, and it's just a guideline. Um, the American Diabetes Association for years has recommended that A1C less than seven, but as you can see here, they um, have said, this has actually been for years, it's been for decades now, they say that if people have a lot of comorbidity, shortened lifespan, severe hypoglycemia, social costs, social or cost issues, that you can back off in an A1C of less than around eight, may be more appropriate for that person. Um, you can see guidelines from a lot of professional organizations here. I wanna point out that the American College of Physicians, which is um, you know, the other uh, organization I know a lot of us kind of follow, they recommend that for most patients in the seven to eight range is um, good enough and that you get small incremental benefit going less than seven. And so that's what's recommended. Anyway, so since historically, you know, we define diabetes by the blood sugar and we target blood sugar for control, I now want to spend just a couple moments talking about, well, what, what are we doing when we're controlling the blood sugar or choosing a, a regimen for uh, treating diabetes? So as I say, historically, we want to optimize the blood sugar. And the reason we're doing that is that we know from um, decades now of randomized controlled trials, as long as epidemiological work, that controlling the blood sugar reduces eye, kidney, and nerve disease. So it improves these um, diabetes complications. The lower the blood sugar, the less the effects of this, but really you don't get a lot of incremental benefit um, in the seven to eight range. You do um, get a little bit, but um, you know the, the, the risks of medications may outweigh the benefit um, in, in these cases. But Glucose control, eye, kidney, and nerve disease. And glucose control doesn't do a lot, at least in the short run, to improve cardiovascular disease. 
And you know, most of our patients are gonna end up dying of cardiovascular disease. So when we choose our antihyperglycemic regimen these days, it's now recommended that they we also choose regimens that we have been shown in randomized controlled trials to improve cardiorenal outcomes. And as we'll see in the slides that follow, this means GLP-1 receptor agonists and SGLT2 inhibitors are more and more widely recommended for a larger populations because these have been shown to improve cardiorenal outcomes as well as improving blood sugar. Anything you do to improve the blood sugar will reduce the eye, kidney, and nerve disease. So this just summarizes some um, landmark trials. In all of these trials, patients, um, uh, in the first one, it was type 1 diabetes. That was the diabetes control and complication trial published back in around 1993. These others are done in uh, type 2 diabetes. In the U United Kingdom Perspective Diabetes Trial, these were recently diagnosed patients with type 2 diabetes. And in these other trials, which are kind of landmark trials published about the same time, this, these enrolled patients with cardiovascular disease are already at very high risk for cardiovascular disease. And what, what, what they found in all of these trials is, like I mentioned, blood sugar control. These patients in all these trials were randomized to have tight glucose control or conventional therapy. And the details um, you know, varied in all the studies, but you know, some patients were on pumps and metformin and sulfonylureas and insulin. It didn't matter how they got there. The goal was just tight glucose control or conventional. And in the studies that, that amounted to A1Cs of less than around seven-ish versus A1Cs less than about nine-ish. So um, eye, kidney, nerve disease improved in all of these studies, but as you can see in these randomized controlled trials, there was no difference in cardiovascular disease and no difference in death either. In the ACCORD trial, that was a big 5,000 patient trial um, that was actually stopped early because there were increased deaths in the patients with tight glucose control. Now, all of these trials were over a period of about four or five years. And so what we, what we now believe is in, in, the, in four or five years, if you wanna reduce heart attacks and death, controlling the blood sugar is not the way to go. You have to do something else. Now, all of these trials were, had, or most of these trials had a follow-up after the trials ended. So if the trial ended around five years, they followed the patients out for another 15 to 20 years and looked to see what happened. And as you can see, when patients were recently diagnosed in type two or type one in the extension trials, not only were um, uh, the microvascular complications, eye, kidney, and nerve disease improved, but now you started seeing benefits in cardiovascular disease and reductions in death in the extension trials. So now, but, but of note, in the patients that were um, already had high risk for cardiac disease or um, they had cardiovascular disease or they were high risk, there was just no effect of the glucose control. So based on these trials, people started thinking, huh, in the short run, controlling the glucose isn't gonna be enough to reduce um, cardiorenal outcomes in diabetic patients. We still wanna lower the blood sugar to reduce eye, kidney, and nerve disease, but we need to do something else. So now we have um, these agents we'll talk more about that um, the SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists that can do that. So here's another case. This time we've got a 40-year-old woman with type 2 diabetes who's treated with metformin monotherapy. Her A1C is 8.5. She's trying very hard to lose weight, and she's doing a good job. So far, she's lost about 25 pounds. So as you all think about what you would like to add, I'll tell you that I would recommend we treat her with dulaglutide, which is a GLP-1 receptor agonist. So we can all agree her A1C is too high um, and we need to get that down. And we don't have um, any evidence in this um, notation anyway that she has uh, kidney or heart disease, but she needs to lose weight. This is what she's doing. She's working hard to lose weight. So we basically look at our available options here and we say, 
you know, which medication is going to help her achieve her goal. And as most of you are probably aware, the GLP-1 receptor agonists um, are associated with considerable weight loss, and um, some of them are even FDA approved for weight loss in non-diabetic patients. So you kind of look and see what you're trying to accomplish. And in her case, I'm going to add the glagotide. So this slide shows that we have, you know, 11 agents, um, non-insulin agents out there that are FDA approved for treating hyperglycemia and type 2 diabetes. But in very practical terms, we don't use many of these because of side effects, low efficacy, dosing issues. I mean, an amylin agonist, for example, is TID, AC, injectable. Um, and it's just not realistic. It's not very potent either. We just don't use a lot of these agents. So the list just got a lot shorter. And we're going to go through some characteristics of each of the agents shown on this list. I want to go further to say that the most commonly recommended non-insulins right now, the list is even shorter. It's metformin, GLP-1 receptor agonists, and SGLT2 inhibitors. These are the first things we're reaching for. So for most of the patients I'm seeing these days, these are the questions I have. Should they be on metformin and or GLP-1 receptor agonist and or SGLT2 inhibitor and or insulin? So the choices, even though there's like 11 drugs on the market besides insulin, these are the, the most practical choices we have these days. So historically, as um, I'm sure most people on this call are well familiar with, metformin was recommended as a first line agent. And it still is for most patients. Um, first line therapy is generally going to include lifestyle modification and metformin. In fact, it's even recommended that uh, um, patients uh, you know, with prediabetes use metformin to reduce, um, reduce the development of diabetes if it's a, if it's a high risk patient. So this is typically, historically, the first line. But now the recommendations have changed. So in patients who are at very high risk for heart disease, heart failure, CKD, it's now recommended that an SGLT2 inhibitor or a GLP-1 receptor agonist with or without metformin be started as initial therapy. They're appropriate for initial therapy, and that's regardless of what the A1C is, whether they're not, they're on metformin, what their A1C goal is. Um, these things are often now chosen as first line therapy. So now when you see your patients, you shouldn't just be saying, is their glucose what I want it to be? You need to ask yourself, are they achieving their glycemic goal? That's your first question your, and your second simultaneous question. You ask these two questions simultaneously. Do they have heart or kidney disease? If so, I need to think about getting them on one of these if they can afford it. As we all know, they're quite expensive. So um, I'm going to go through um, you know, just some, uh, some, uh, uh, some risks and um, benefits of the agents that are available that we're currently using. And let's start with um, this question that I've asked. So the first question that you ask is, do they have heart disease? And if the answer is yes, we're going to the SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists, but I'll talk about that later. So let's start out with saying, no, they don't have that yet. Like our 42 year old woman, she has type two diabetes, hyperglycemia and obesity. So she doesn't have heart disease or kidney disease yet. So if the answer is no, then you can say, is her A1C goal achieved? So this has become our second um, question, not our first question. So if her A1C goal is already achieved, maybe she was just diagnosed with diabetes, she has an A1C of, of you know, of, of 6.6, .6, that's diabetes, but you'd say, well, but she's meeting her goal. So generally what's recommended still, um, as it has been for years, is if they've already achieved their A1C goal, but they have diabetes, you go ahead and consider metformin in this case. And metformin is considered because it reduces the onset of diabetes in high-risk people, and it's um, cheap and easy and not many side effects. And we know that diabetes is a progressive disease. People with type 2 diabetes get worse with time. So 
If they're already diagnosed with diabetes, just playing the odds that disease is going to progress. So it's recommended to just get them on metformin early. There's no hypoglycemia. You'll lose a little bit of body weight. They're cheap. These are on the $4 list. Now you get a little bit of nausea and diarrhea, um, but uh, you know that can be managed in most patients by you know starting at low doses and moving up uh, slowly. And some people just can't tolerate it, and this is off the table. But most patients can. Also, if you change to the XR um, uh, preparation, the nausea and diarrhea might be a little bit better. So, well, this is going to be for most people um, at the time of diagnosis. They're neutral when it comes to cardiovascular disease and kidney disease. They don't really do much. In the past, we sort of wondered if they kind of helped the heart. If they do, it's probably not very much. Um, so I just put a question mark here. And then there's a concern about B12 deficiency. So just keep that in, your, in, in the back of your head when, you, um, when you're treating people with metformin and, and, and be alert for that possibility. It's not um, usually clinically significant, but it may be present, so keep your eye out. So that's if the A1C goal is achieved. So if their A1C goal is not achieved, then you start asking, well, what does, what's important to this patient? What does this patient need to accomplish? So in some patients, their main goal is to not have hypoglycemia. Maybe they're a truck driver or a surgeon or someone you really don't want to have hypoglycemia. Maybe like uh, our example patient here, maybe they just want to lose weight. That's their goal. And maybe they don't have any money and you've just got to minimize cost. So um, we're going to go through these options in the next few slides, but it's important here when you're taking the next agent after metformin, and, and generally, if they don't have cardiovascular disease or cardiorenal disease, metformin is going to be your first choice for everybody. It's cheap and it's easy. It's been in the world for 30 years. It's safe and it's effective. So that's your first choice for everyone. But then after that, you just say, what do I want to accomplish? So let's start with sul sulfonylureas because those are the ones that we've been using most. And that's what a lot of people will reach for, a glipizide or a gliburide or a thimipiride after a metformin. It's not my next choice anymore, but um, I, I want to just go through why. Now, sulfonylureas um, are the only uh, uh, non-insulin agents that are associated with hypoglycemia. Actually, the glinides are too, but uh, uh, we rarely prescribe those. So these things, you get low blood sugar, and this is kind of rate limiting. This is mostly a concern as you reach an A1C goal of around seven. It's probably not going to cause low blood sugar if someone's got an A1C of 12. Um, so that's not a as much of a concern, but it is a concern. People gain a little bit of weight on these. And in type 2 diabetes, you know, weight management is the most important thing. That's why lifestyle modification should be, um, you know, uh, encouraged and reinforced at every single visit because that's the best thing that people with type 2 diabetes can do to manage their glucose. These are cheap, they're well tolerated, and they're pretty much neutral when it comes to cardiovascular disease and CKD. Now there has been a suggestion over the years that they may actually worsen cardiovascular disease, but I put a question mark here because that's controversial even though the idea has been kicked around for decades now. And if there is harm, it's probably small. I want to just emphasize too that um, hypoglycemia is more than just being uncomfortable. It causes a lot of psychological distress and this is rate limiting for a lot of patients. They don't take their medications because they don't like how it feels. But it's also associated with falls, fractures, dementia, increased cardiovascular events. You particularly want to avoid hypoglycemia in someone who has uh, cardiac disease because it could precipitate ischemia. So hypoglycemia is not just a little bit of uncomfortable, it's associated with a lot of bad outcomes. And so if you can control blood sugar without causing hypoglycemia, that's important. And I always think it's important to make sure you've asked your patient about this. Um, and, and if they mention the hypoglycemia, take it seriously and um, make medication adjustments with that in mind. 
Um, I remember when I took my, uh, you know, my mother in to see her uh, primary care doc when she was in her late 80s. And she had this um, nice little log book full of documented hypoglycemia. And she had an A1C of seven and a half. And the guy goes, oh, that's pretty good. And didn't do anything. It's like, uh, no, it's not pretty good because she's got lots of hypoglycemia here. And she was an old lady. Anyway, just um, I, I don't want to harp too much on this. But the reason I'm doing that is because there's a huge literature that we don't de-intensify regimens enough when people are having hypoglycemia. So be on the lookout, adjust medication regimens if you can. So the next class of agents um, I want to just review are the thiazolidine diones. Um, uh, you know, these, these three agents here, these are the cheap agents. After these three agents, it's gonna start getting expensive. So the biggest um, benefit I think these have is just they're cheap. They're cheap and they have no hypoglycemia. So they've got that going for them. People do gain weight on these. Um, a lot of it is just edema, fluid, but they also gain fat on TZDs. So that's sort of a counter to what we're trying to accomplish in our type two diabetic patients. They're easy to take, they're pills, they're well tolerated. So there's no common adverse effects of these, but there are these concerns about uh, heart failure, fracture and bladder cancer. And I'll show you a little bit about fracture on the next slide. Um, when we talk about cardiovascular and cardiorenal, they're just, they're just neutral. You know, once again, I'm gonna call all these just, it's mixed for cardiovascular disease. If there's benefits or risks, they're small. And CKD is just, just neutral here. But heart failure is very well documented. So be very concerned about people with like CKD or existing heart failure for sure. You don't wanna precipitate that by starting a TZD. Bladder cancer, uh, it's increased risk, but very, very rare. Fracture though is a, a big concern. This slide will show you that, um, you know, after like about, I think it's around five years in this particular trial, there's a huge increase of fractures with this um, thiazolidine dione pioglitazone versus placebo. But the increased risk in fracture starts happening soon. Within a year, you can start seeing these curves separate and it just continues to separate. Now, people with type 2 diabetes are already at baseline increased risk for fracture. So and that might be counterintuitive because they tend to be overweight. Um, which we think of as protecting people from fracture. Well, there's something about bone quality and type two diabetes that isn't quite normal. So even though bone density is not decreased from non-diabetic patients in type two, bone density is about the same, but fracture risk is baseline increased risk and adding a TZD will worsen that risk. So that's sort of like, the cheap options out there. And you know, we've used them for years. There'll still be patients that you decide that the benefits of these outweigh the risks. They're all effective at lowering the blood sugar. And we know that lowering the blood sugar reduces eye, kidney, and nerve disease. So especially in people with cost considerations, this is, might be where you stop. After this, all you've got is insulin. All right, let's move to the newer agents here. And the next group of agents I'm gonna talk about are these incretins. The incretin hormones, um, orangutan-based um, therapies increase GLP-1 effects. And they do that, the DPP-4 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists um, work in the same pathway, but they have different effects. They work in different ways. So in generally, both of these um, classes of agents are prolonging GLP-1 effects. And just as a refresher, GLP-1 is secreted from the gut and rapidly inhibited by DPP-4. So native GLP-1 is not in the bloodstream very long because DPP-4 inactivates it. If you hang this around, GLP-1 increases insulin secretion, decreases glucagon, delays gastric emptying, and also increases increases satiety. Those are all great things for someone with type 2 diabetes. This increase in insulin is interesting because it increases insulin in a glucose-dependent fashion. So if somebody's blood sugar is high, it increases the insulin. 
But if someone's blood sugar is normal, it does not increase the insulin. So this, this hormone is really helpful to keep around if you can. So the GLP-1 receptor agonists are just resistant to inactivation by DPP-4. And the DPP-4 inhibitors, since these things inhibit GLP-1, if you inhibit the inhibitor, it prolongs the action of GLP-1. So that's what this group of hormone does. I grouped them together just to, to point out that you would not treat a patient with both of these, the same patient with both of these, because they're working in a similar pathway. So they don't really have additive benefits. For the other agents, you can you know, just add agents with different mechanisms of action and get additive effects. We can't really put these two together because they're in the same pathway. So these things, I just think of them as overall being kind of benign. Um, there's no hypoglycemia, there's no effects on body weight, they're not an injectable, it's a pill, there's no common adverse effect. And even the concern about pancreatitis, it's not a big concern. Uh, it's not a big concern for me because the data are um, uh, kind of controversial about whether this even occurs. Now, if I had a person with chronic pancreatitis or severe pancreatitis that was a problem, I probably wouldn't start one. Um, but it's not a big concern. I mean, obesity in itself is a risk for um, pancreatitis, and that's probably a bigger risk than this medication. And they're just neutral when it comes to cardiovascular, cardiorenal disease. I mean, uh, CKD, it's just neutral. They don't do much. And they're expensive. This is where the drugs start getting expensive. So I don't reach for these very often. I do sometimes, but the, the fact of the matter is, if I'm going to pay 500 bucks for something, I want more benefits. I'm going to want the cardiorenal protection, which is the next what the next two class of agents offer. And I'll talk about those um, in a bit. I do want to just um, point out that there have been trials where basically these DPP-4 inhibitors have no effect on cardiovascular disease or CKD, none at all. All right, now we've got a lot of yellow and green on this um, list because things are getting a lot more interesting now when we get to the classes of the GLP-1 receptor agonists and SGLT2 inhibitors. Once again, no hypoglycemia, can get significant weight loss on these, and two of the um, drugs um, uh, in this class are now FDA approved for weight loss in, uh, in non-diabetic patients. These things are great. No hypoglycemia, lots of weight loss. With semaglutide, um, which has a trade name of Wegovy, that was just recently um, FDA approved for weight loss in non-diabetic people a few um, months ago within the last year. Uh, the, the major trial that was done on this, patients were losing like 17% of their body weight in conjunction with lifestyle modification. So that's, that's pretty huge. Um, so a lot of weight loss but they're starting to get pretty expensive too. So, you know, depending on someone's insurance, they may or may not be able to take these. Now, these are mostly injectable. Uh, Victoza, uh, loraglutide is an injectable once a day. And if that's all a patient can get with their insurance, that's what I prescribe. But most of these agents are injectable once a week. And that's like the Ozempic and the Trulicity, those are once a week, and that's what generally are preferred and tend to have the best effects on weight loss as well. So, um, but injectable, a lot of patients don't like it, but once a week isn't a big deal. There's pins, they're easy to use, um, um, but it is a consideration um, for some people. Now, I emphasize mostly injectable because there is one oral GLP-1 receptor agonist on the market right now, and I'll show you a little bit about that in the next slide. So the most common adverse effects are diarrhea and um, nausea. And just like with metformin, you start at low doses, you titrate the, the, the dose up slowly, and, and that way um, people uh, um, can tolerate the, the side effects more easily. Um, this is a rate-limiting side effect. Some patients cannot tolerate this, and so you give it a try. Um, most patients love this because of the effects on body weight and um, blood sugar, but um, just I always warn people before they start it that this may happen and ask them to just sort of hang in there because the side effects do tend to get a little bit better at time with time. 
Now, once again, we've got this question mark about pancreatitis and C-cell, well, pancreatitis, which may or may not be real. Um, once again, I probably wouldn't choose this for someone who was having a lot of problems uh, historically or, or um, currently with pancreatitis. I wouldn't start them, but um, you know, if, if they've never had that problem or they uh, had it once and it's gone away, I, I don't really hesitate to use uh, GLP-1 receptor agonist because it's, it's not even clear from the research that this is a real risk. So um, if it's there, it's small. And I think the benefits probably outweigh that for the majority of patients. C-cell hyperplasia in rodents has been um, seen. There's a concern about medullary thyroid cancer because of that. But medullary thyroid cancer is so very, 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 very rare that um, this certainly isn't a concern. If you had someone with an MEN syndrome, you know, a history of medullary thyroid cancer in their family, sure, you might avoid it, but that's 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 rare. Now, these are cardio the big green boxes here because these protect the heart and the kidney. These uh, reduce the effects of heart attacks, strokes, heart failure and the progression of CKD. And I'm going to discuss those in conjunction with the SGLT2 inhibitors in a minute. But I do want to just point out that there is an oral GLP-1 receptor agonist, semaglutide, is now available. You take it once a day. It seems to have similar efficacy to the injectables, similar side effects. It's a little tricky to take. And I, frankly, I don't prescribe this very much because patients um, I speak to would rather have an, in, an, an injection once a week than go through the hassle of taking this once a day in the morning. You have to um, take it first thing in the morning after not eating or drinking overnight. And you take it with a very small amount of water. It has to be four ounces or less. So it's it, you know, we have a lot of patients taking, for example, you know, something like a Lendronate once a week. They're drinking with a full glass of water um, and having to stay up upright for um, a half an hour. This is like the opposite. You have to be real dry when you get it in and, and not drink. And you have to do it every day. So it's a little cumbersome. Have to wait at least 30 minutes before eating, drinking, or taking other medicines. But it is an option for, um, you know, for patients who would prefer this. So finally, I want to talk about the SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, and this is a reminder of how they work. In the normal kidney, uh, most of the glucose is absorbed here in the um, early proximal tub tubule um, via this transporter SGLT2, about 90% comes here. A little bit more comes with the aid of SGLT1, and there's no glucose in the urine. In an, a non-diabetic person with normal glucose tolerance. If you block this reabsorption, you get a lot of glucosuria, and this is the mechanism by which they work. So they're kind of mild diuretics and they cause um, glucosuria. In terms of their clinical effects, you lose weight, not as much as with the GLP-1 receptor agonist, but you do lose weight with these. They're expensive too. Now, you know, these prices I haven't updated recently, but they're in that ballpark and it depends on insurance. And of course, um, uh, you know, whether you've got a, a good RX coupon or whatever, but they're expensive. They're pills, it's not an injection. And the most common adverse effects because of the glucosuria is urinary tract infections or genital infections. As it turns out, those don't happen that often. And I don't have many patients. We have lots of patients on these and they're rarely stopping because of these. Just, it's very rare, but you know, it is a concern. So you might choose to not try that in certain patients who are bothered by these. I think the real concerns are DKA and fracture. Euglycemic DKA occurs with the SGLT2 inhibitors at an increased um, frequency to, compared to people who aren't on them. It's still rare but it's more than if they weren't taking it. So if you have a ketosis prone patient with type two diabetes, I would think twice before I started that. If you've got patients that are having DKA, you sure don't want to increase that risk further. So once again, rare, but that's real. Fracture risk, um, we're still understanding that and it's probably real as well. There used to be an FDA um, warning about it, but they removed the warning a while back because they said that they felt like the benefits um, 
the strong benefits of these outweighed the small risk of fractures. But here's the interesting part. These are both cardiorenally protective, just like the GLP-1 receptor agonists. So my next few slides, I will show you about that. So this was um, a meta-analysis that included about uh, 77,000 patients with type 2 diabetes. And um, so there were a bunch of studies included where patients were, had been randomized to have a GLP-1 receptor agonist or placebo. They were not comparing GLP-1s to SGLT2 inhibitors. They were just looking at the effects with GLP-1 receptors and then also looking at effects with SGLT2 inhibitors. So if patients had established heart disease, both the GLP-1 receptor agonist and the SGLT2 inhibitors, both of them reduce cardiovascular events by about 15%. So they're about the same in people who have known heart disease. On the other hand, if people had multiple risk factors for heart disease, neither of these really helped very much, okay? And so um, sort of the take home from this slide is if you've got a 40 year old that doesn't have a lot of risks of heart disease, you may decide to use an SGLT2 inhibitor because of the weight loss benefits or a SGLT2 inhibitor because um, you want to um, give your patient a non-injectable that's not associated with hypoglycemia. You can still use these for glycemic control, but don't expect them to reduce cardiovascular events. That hasn't been demonstrated yet. Um, maybe, maybe the trials are too short. Maybe after 10 or 20 years on, on these agents, they will, but don't have um, trial data to support that yet. That said, I know that we have a lot of patients out there that maybe their heart disease or their kidney disease, especially their heart disease and diagnosed, but you know they have it because they've got every risk in the, in the book. And so those are people that I am reaching for these. If maybe it hasn't been diagnosed, but I know they have it. And that's generally what's recommended. Heart failure um, is different. So um, if you look at hospitalization for heart failure in this study, the top panel is showing what happened with the GLP-1 receptor agonists. And the bottom is um, our major trials with the GLP-1 um, uh, inhibitors. So there was, you know, three big trials here, you know, involving thousands of patients and up in the GLP-1 receptor agonists, four big trials with thousands of patients. Like I say, there's 77,000 patients all together in this. So if you look at hospitalization for heart failure, the GLP-1 receptor agonists as a whole, you know, was, it was a trend, you know, it, you know, not statistically significant, but a strong trend towards about a 7% reduction in events, um, hospitalizations for heart failure with GLP-1s. So, you know, that's not overwhelming, but it's there. For the SGLT2 inhibitors, on the other hand, there was a strong, like 30% reduction in hospitalization for heart failure in patients with CHF. So these, these um, SGLT2 inhibitors are, are uh, FDA approved now for heart failure, even if people don't have uh, diabetes. So strong effect, not as strong an effect for GLP-1s. And what to do with this information is if someone has heart failure, you reach first for the SGLT2 inhibitor. If they can't take that for some reason, then you reach next for the GLP-1 receptor agonist. Finally, I want to talk about the effects of these on renal outcomes. Um, so this, um, this top panel is showing um, GLP-1s and SGLT2 inhibitors um, on this composite outcome of macroalbuminuria, worsening EGFR, end-stage renal disease, or renal death. And you can see GLP-1 receptor agonists are pretty good. You know, you're, you know, once again, you're going to have, you know, maybe a almost 20% reduction in events here, not so bad. Um, SGLT2 inhibitors, even stronger effect in this bottom panel. So um, if you have kidney disease, these are more beneficial. Now, a lot of people would say that the more meaningful um, components of this composite renal outcome 
are worsening GFR in stage renal disease or deaths. And they say, eh, my macroalbuminuria, let's take that out of the analysis. If you take that out of the analysis because it's not as hard a clinical endpoint as worsening EGFR in stage renal disease or death, then the GLP-1 receptor agonist, just a moderate, you know, maybe a little less than 10% um, uh, benefit for the SGLT2 inhibitors are still very beneficial. So what to do with this information is that if you've got a patient with CKD, you can go ahead and reach first for the SGLT2 inhibitor because they have the biggest effects, whether you're looking at the inclusion or exclusion of macroalbuminuria. But if they can't tolerate it for some reason, you still get some effects with the GLP-1 receptor agonist. So go ahead and, and reach for that as your, as your second choice. So what do we do with that information? So here's another case, a 70-year-old patient with type 2 diabetes and CHF who's taking metformin. And uh, her A1C is 6.9%, EGFR is 70, and what do you want to do? Well, in the olden days, you would have, and, and that's just like the, the last, and I joke about the olden days because that's just a few years ago. What you would have said is her A1C is great. It's 6.9%. On metformin, she's doing well, let's just leave her alone. But now you'll say she's got heart failure. And so you should add uh, an SGLT2 inhibitor. If she can't tolerate it, then you'd add the GLP-1 receptor agonist. So this slide just sort of summarizes what I've been saying. Um, you ask that question first, do they have heart failure, CKD or cardiovascular disease? If the answer is yes, and heart failure or CKD predominate, your first choice is going to be the SGLT2 inhibitor. Second choice is the GLP-1 receptor agonist if they can't tolerate or they have a contraindication um, that for the SGLT2 inhibitor. If they don't have heart failure or CKD, but they do have cardiovascular disease, you can use either one of these. Now, after you've asked the question you know, and answered it yes, and you've started them on one of these, then you still look at glycemic goals. And so then you come back down here and say, did they achieve their glycemic goal? And if the answer is yes, okay, you still may add some metformin, just looking at risks and benefit. And if not, then you're going to add one of these other agents. Um, so it's two things you're trying to accomplish, controlling the blood sugar and getting them on these cardiorenally protective agents, if appropriate. I just throw in this slide because um, what I've been talking about is straight out of the most recent American Diabetes Association um, uh, practice uh, recommendations that came out in January. And so this is available um, online or in the slide if anybody wants it. All right, so now let's switch gears from the non-insulins and move over to the injectable insulins. Um, well, not the injectables, Let's move to insulin now. I want to talk about insulin because as we all know, diabetes, type two diabetes is a progressive disease and many patients eventually are going to need insulin to control their blood sugar. So here's a patient with type two. She doesn't have heart failure or CKD or cardiovascular disease. She's already on metformin and trulicity and she's got this A1C of 11. The only thing you can do for her is add insulin. Insulin will bring any level of A1C to your goal, whatever your, that goal is. And um, in this 42 year old, you probably want it to be less than seven. So insulin is, is what you'd have to do. Now you may think about these others, but they're not even gonna come close to getting yours. You can drop that person's blood sugar by maybe a percent by adding these. It's not enough, it's time for insulin. So when you choose which insulin to start, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the regimen I would choose would be um, a single injection of basal insulin at that time. But I want to acknowledge here, there's lots of different options for insulin now. Um, we've got rapid, short, intermediate, long, and ultra long acting insulins is how they're often categorized. These intermediate, long, and ultra long acting insulins are usually called the basal insulins. This is the insulin that controls blood sugar in the fasting and pre-meal state. It's not Regimens are not designed to cover postprandial hyperglycemia. You just do it to control the fasting and free meal. And this is what most of our patients with type 2 diabetes need, just the basal. 
So you've got all of these different options. And um, I just want to point out that, that there's lots of insulin options available right now. So besides looking at whether it's a basal or a bolus, these short acting and rapid acting, so those are the pre-meal insulins. There's other things. So for example, a Frieza is a regular insulin that's in, uh, it's an inhaled insulin. I, I, I have never prescribed this um, since it was reintroduced. It came out, oh, a decade ago and I gave it to some patients. It didn't go well and they discontinued it for a number of years, but now it's back, but it's out there. If there's an inhaled insulin option for you um, if your patient needs that for some reason. I also want to point out the concentrated insulin. There's lots of concentrations right now. Most of the regular insulin we use is U100. That's 100 units for each milliliter. But there's also U200, U300, and U500. And these concentrated insulins are out there um, for people who are requiring more than about 60 units in a single injection. For patients that are requiring more than about 60 units in a single injection, it um, would be prudent to think about one of these concentrated insulin because you get the same insulin in a smaller volume and more consistent efficacy in the patient. It's less painful. It's more, um, you know, because you're not injecting so much. You're just injecting a little bit. So it's, it's um, more comfortable to the patients and it's absorbed better. So you get more consistent glycemic control. Another thing I put in green here, these are the, uh, um, the biosimilars. So um, uh, uh, glargine comes as Lantus that a lot of people are familiar with, but um, uh, you've probably been asked to switch a lot of patients to basal glar. So it's it's um, kind of like a generic drug, it's a biosimilar, so it's a little cheaper, but, um, and it's slightly different from the Lantus, but for all practical purposes, it's glargine. Now yellow here, these, um, it's important to look at these yellow, um, yellowed out because the human insulins, regular NPH, U500, uh, these are much cheaper, as we'll see, may be important <laughs> to a lot of patients. And I use these uh, heavily. These are kind of my first, my go-to just because cost is an option for so many of my patients. This shows how a vial of NPH costs 26 bucks at Walmart versus a vial of uh, Lantus is $256. Now there's nothing wrong with Lantus. Lantus is great. All these insulins are great, but they're expensive. And so um, I just encourage you to think about um, the cost of these agents um, for our patients where that's important. Now, um, uh, this is for the vials of NPH. Um, if you go to a pin, the insulin pin, you've lost the cost advantage, which is too bad because pins are great. Pins are easier to use and may have improved adherence. Um, patients like them better, but they are more expensive. Now, historically, I mean, in, in looking at these different um, uh, basal options out there, you know, we have these pretty little curves and you say, okay, glargine is once a day, but NPH has a peak and it doesn't last as long, so it's twice a day. And I know that's historically that we've always talked about, but that's not the reality. Pharmacokinetic data do not always predict clinical outcomes. And in type two diabetes, we typically make some insulin about 50% of patients can achieve control with a single injection of basal insulin alone. All of those insulins are up for grabs, including NPH. This slide shows that although intuitively you would think that four shots a day are better than one shot a day, that just doesn't happen. This was a randomized controlled trial where bedtime NPH, this is NPH once a day is just as good as um, four injections a day. So one injection's enough. This was the treat to trial, uh, treat to target trial published 20 years ago. And I show this to you because patients were treated with NPH or Lantus um, once a day each. It was not twice a day NPH, it was once a day NPH at bedtime or once a day Lantus at bedtime. They were given a titration schedule. And as you can see, there was no differences between A1C or fasting glucose. Little bit different hypoglycemia in that trial, 
but it was 0.7 episodes per patient per year, and that may or may not be clinically significant. Um, there's several publications that have looked to see if there's any benefit from the expensive analogs versus NPH. There was a JAMA article a while back that said that the basal analogs um, were not better than NPH when it came to ED visits, hospital admissions, or glucose control. Cochrane uh, uh, reviews came up with the same uh, conclusion. So all the basals are fine. Type doesn't matter as much as regimen and adherence. Nothing wrong with Lantus, it's just more expensive. So finally, to just finish up, here's a patient on metformin, trulicity, and NPH at bedtime. Their fasting glucose is fine, which you'd expect because this is given to control fasting. Their A1C is not. So what would you do? And this is where I would add Lispro before the largest meal of the day. You're not gonna change NPH to Lantus because they're the same for A1C control. Nobody thinks any different from that. You're not gonna increase the NPH at bedtime because their fasting glucose is fine. You're not gonna add NPH in the morning because they're fine, glucose is all day long. It's just their big dinner comes and they eat. So that's where you need the rapid insulin before dinner. That's just shown here in this picture. So um, just in conclusion for insulin, start with a single injection of basal insulin at bedtime. NPH vials and syringes are the lowest cost, similar clinical effects as the newer analogs. Pins are easier, but they're more expensive. Titrate insulin to normalize the fasting glucose to about 100, 130. If the fasting glucose is at goal and A1C is above goal, then consider adding a short acting insulin before the largest meal of the day. And you can, regular is the cheapest, um, but adherence may be better with Humalog, Novolog, or Pedra, and add more injections if you need to based on blood glucose monitoring. And that's what I have. If anyone has a question or a comment, I think we have a bit of time. I do, thank you, Dr. Pendergrass. We actually have two questions already. For just a reminder, you can put your, submit your questions through the Q&A box, the chat box, or raise your hand feature. First question is, is it true that pioglitazone works better earlier in diabetes diagnosis? Um, well, I, I, I don't know of a study that specifically looked at that, um, um, but my, my thought is maybe, probably. Um, we know that um, uh, pioglitazone is an insulin sensitizer. So um, it, it can work well um, at any point in, in, in the, the uh, natural history of the disease, but as long as the person is making insulin on their own. So if you've got early in the diagnosis of diabetes, if someone's making insulin on their own, pioglitazone is gonna work um, just fine. Later, say the person's already on insulin, it'll still work because it will reduce insulin requirements, but it wouldn't be okay as monotherapy. So pioglitazone is better as monotherapy early in the diagnosis but um, uh, it can be great in combination with insulin or other agents later in the diagnosis because it does improve insulin sensitivity. So my next question, I'm seeing it right here, is what is your experience with gangrene and SGLT2 inhibitors? Never seen it. We worried about that when it came out, but I'm just telling you the, the genital infections are just not that common. They've been reported, so I'm not saying they never happen, but um, they just have not turned out to be as big a deal as everyone concerned. People don't get UTIs and urinary tract infections all the time. Here's another question that says, what goes into your decision for who to start metformin with prediabetes? Would you consider SGLT2 or GLP-1 in prediabetes if they have CHF or CKD? Those are great questions. And so let me just take the first one part of it first. Um, and if patients have diabetes, we know from a lot of research now that metformin is most effective in prediabetes if patients are younger, more overweight, and have higher A1Cs or a history of gestational diabetes. So if you have a 25-year-old with a BMI of 35 and an A1C of um, 6.1, start right away. That's the person who's going to benefit. But on the other hand, if you have a skinny 70-year-old patient 
with just marginally increased A1C of say 5.8, they're not gonna benefit. So the cutoffs are A1C greater than six, BMI over 35, and age less than 60, or a history of gestational diabetes. That's who benefits mostly. And you know, you don't have to meet all of those criteria, but just sort of add up the risk. The younger, the more overweight, and the higher the A1C, that's who um, benefits. And so for the other part of the question, would I consider adding SGLT2 inhibitor or GLP-1 in prediabetes if they have CHF or CKD? Yes, I would, because um, what I would consider and what would be great, quite frankly, about their prediabetes is because you might get the SGLT2 inhibitor FDA uh, approved by their insurance if they have prediabetes. That's what we have found. It's a little easier because if these, these SGLT2 inhibitors are recommended in CHF and CKD, even if they don't have diabetes. So absolutely, if they have prediabetes, I would consider starting one of these. And that's the case of a person I would start before I'd start metformin. And is there a limitation to efficacy regarding how much long acting insulin can be given? Is there any validity to the thought that LANT is more than 60 units a night would be best to be split twice daily instead? Um, that's another wonderful question. Um, the right amount of insulin is as much as it takes. I've got patients on hundreds of units of insulin. If that's what it takes, that's what you should do. Um, but if they're on a lot, I, I would give them a concentrated insulin. Um, I think it's a great idea. Sometimes for whatever reason, you can't get a concentrated insulin. And then the next thing to do is you split anything more than 60 units to um, two doses, but not twice a day. That's really different. I give NPH at bedtime to normalize the fasting glucose. And if the fasting glucose is normal and they're high throughout the day, then I think about adding um, another injection of MPH in the morning. But if they need more insulin, let's say they, um, they're on 100, you know, you want to put them on 70 units, let's say, of MPH at night because their glucose in the morning is still 200. They need more insulin at night. They don't need an injection in the morning. They need it at night. So I would split that 70 units to 35 and 35, both of those injections given at night, but in two different places. So you just split the depot. You don't split the time of day. And I'm rushing through and that's, that's all I got in the chat, I think. I think you're good. That was uh, perfect. Well, we can wait another a minute or so if anybody has uh, an additional question. I can stare awkwardly at you and wait. <laughs> but otherwise, thank you so much, Dr. Pendergrass. That was really great. We're getting a lot of thank yous and this was very right. helpful, but wonderful. All right. Okay, well, um, everybody have, oh, there's another question. Do you want me to answer it? Yes, yes, please. Uh, it, it came in. When would I you consider it. to add a DPP for? Um, I rarely do um, because they just don't help with your heart or your kidney. But I'll tell you a patient that I'm seeing right now that I just yesterday uh, um, continued his DPP-4 monotherapy. That's a guy who has chronic kidney disease and a mildly elevated glucose. We tried him on a GLP-1 receptor agonist and an SGLT-2 inhibitor, and he just couldn't tolerate them. He's got bad CKD and he can't use metformin because of the contraindication. And so really all I had was a DPP-4 inhibitor and it brings his A1C down from about um, eight and a half to seven and a half and he's happy. So that's what I would, that's the sort of situation what I use. They can't use anything else for whatever reasons and um, they still need a little something. And I think, but these are not other questions. Oh, they're really great oh, comments. So I'm copying them. <laughs> all right. Okay, folks. Well, um, thank y'all and um, have a great day. All right. Thank Bye. you. Bye.